Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Shulam, and I didn't assign myself this topic. That's a topic for sure to get me in trouble. Uh, but I want us to start with a prayer. I'm going to invite Jonathan Terem, brother for, who preaches in Chicago, to come and lead us in prayer, a Jewish brother. And uh, then we're going to get right into our topic. Let's pray. Blessed are you, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love and mercy. We praise you for being our creator, our redeemer, our savior. We thank you for what you have done through your son and your spirit, how the gospel is being preached all over the world. And we pray especially for the Jewish people the brethren of Jesus according to the flesh, and for the work that Joseph Shulam is doing with Nativia in spreading the gospel in the place where the gospel began, in Jerusalem. We pray for this work. We lift up Joseph Shulam to you. We pray that you guide him, that you open his mouth, and through your spirit continue to enable him to glorify you by preaching the gospel to the Jewish people. As your Apostle Paul so passionately agonized over his own people according to the flesh, we lift up the Jewish people to you. We pray for all your people everywhere, that Jews and Gentiles will fulfill what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 15, that they will come together and glorify you through Jesus Christ. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Jesus the Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. Well, restoration. How many of you have read Alexander Campbell's the Millennial Harbinger. Raise your hand. Not bad, but a minority. An abused minority. Uh, how many of you have read the Christian Baptist? Same people. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Great, brethren. I'm not a Campbellite, but I love Campbell. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, of Yeshua HaMashiach. But Campbell and the Restoration Movement did something that was absolutely fantastic and of the utmost importance for the truth of Christianity. Because without truth, all religion is idolatry. If we don't have the truth, we have, could have wonderful churches, wonderful temples, wonderful worship and feel good religion and we'd still have nothing because essentially the difference between Judaism and biblical Christianity from all the other religions of the world is truth now truth has a certain characteristic I'm a graduate of David Lipscomb College but not only in in Bible but also in chemistry and chemistry, we use test tubes. And truth can be put into a test tube. It's something that can be tested and ought to be tested. And as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are commanded to test everything twice. Paul commands us twice. The, the clearest place is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20, 21, when it says, test all things. Choose that which is good and reject that which is bad. Uh, if our faith cannot stand the test of truth, we are nothing but idolaters. We have no leg to stand on. And that doesn't make difference what kind of talented preachers we have that can make you feel good and tell you what you want to hear and massage your ego. All these things are good, but they're not truth. And without truth, there is no true Christianity. 
Do you agree? Good. We already made a point. Because essentially, our task as disciples of, of Yeshua is to follow the path of our forefathers, the path of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, King David, the prophets that lead to the Messiah. Without those prophecies and without the promises that God made to Moses and to Abraham and to David, Jesus would be E.T. You could say, E.T., call home. <laughs> you know? Because each, if he's not the son of, of David, he's not our Messiah, is he? He can't be. How many of you can quote the first verse of Genesis 1? Raise your hands. Great. How many of you can quote the first verse of the Gospel, of the Gospel of Matthew? Raise your hand. What is this? What kind of Christians are you? <laughs> you guys know the Old Testament better than you know the New Testament. All right, brother, you raise your hand. Stand up and quote it. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. You're in John, not Matthew. <laughs> All right. Take one point off. All right. Who can quote Matthew 1.1? 1, 1? Beside this lowly Jew over here. <laughs> All right, Jonathan. Stand up and quote it. Loud. These are the generations of Jesus Christ, uh, son of Abraham, son of David. Almost right. Son of David, son of Abraham. This verse is very important because the Holy Spirit saw fit to start the New Testament with this verse. And it's a key verse. I'll give you a demonstration how important this verse is. It starts, this is the book of the genealogy. There's only one more place in the whole Bible that this phrase is used. It's in the book of Genesis. It's within the framework of this celebration. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. But Adam, uh, we have a problem with his genealogy. Right? He had no mother and no father. God created him out of the dust of the earth. So why does Matthew start with this verse, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ? Because any Jew that would read that text, immediately his mind would jump to Genesis 5 and say, if God can create Adam from the dirt of the earth and breathe into his nostril the spirit of life, God can inseminate a woman without the agency of men and have a son. So right from the first words of the gospel, the Holy Spirit already is answering the objection that might come up later. And then he says, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He capsules out the whole history of Israel in this one verse. The, Israel, the history of Israel starts with Abraham, through David, through Yeshua, and all the way to the end. Yeah. So in this one verse, we are capturing the essential truth of the whole gospel. Now, what does restoration mean? Restoration essentially means uh, you have a you bought an old house. It's in bad repair. It doesn't have good plumbing. It doesn't have good windows and doors. It needs a reconstruction, a restoration. Now, restoration is if it ain't broken, don't fix it. That's a good Tennessee line, right? I learned something in Lipscomb. 
when I graduated, we invited Batsel Barrett Baxter for dinner because we were leaving for Israel with my wife. And he came for dinner. I remember even what we fixed him to eat. And when we were already to eating the dessert, he said, Joe, if you want God to use you in the land of Israel, you better forget everything we taught you at David Lipscomb College. <laughs> and he was sincere. Batsel Barrett Baxter didn't have a whole lot of sense of humor. <laughs> so, but he was a great man of God. But, but essentially, essentially, restoration only is necessary when things are broken, when things are dysfunctional, when things are not in good repair. That's when you restore a building. I worked... Uh, I, I went to school before I came to Lipscomb to the Hebrew University and got my undergraduate degree at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem in biblical archaeology and in Bible. And every summer we had to spend the summer actually digging or working in some dig. And I participated in this restoration of a city of, of Da in the Negev Desert. They dug it out before me and then we came to do the restoration. So for more than a month, for six weeks, in the summer heat of the Negev, what we did is we sorted out stones. We carried the stones from this pile to that pile and numbered them on the way. <laughs> Gave them an address. Uh, it's hard work to do restoration. It's harder to do restoration than to build something from scratch. And it requires... As several essentials. The first essential is you've got to know what things looked like when they were in good repair, when they were new. In order to restore something to its original state, you've got to know what it looked like before, before it broke down. Because if you don't have an idea of what it looked like before it broke down, you could never restore it. I had a friend in Athens, Georgia, uh, there are people here from, that were from the Campus View in Athens, right? Is there anybody from Campus View? Uh, we have people from Campus View over here. There was a brother in Georgia that his hobby was restoring old cars. And he looked all over the United States for original parts to restore those old cars back to their original state. He had sent to even to Mexico to get parts from Mexico in order to get the original parts of the cars so they could rebuild them and bring them back to their functional old state. So restoration is something that a priori confesses that the present situation is no good, is broken. It needs repair. Are we making progress? Do you agree with me? Good. Because, because it is essential to understand that there is no need for restoration if you're happy with what you've got. If Alexander Campbell, Stone, Raccoon John Smith, and, and the restoration preachers that had the Cane Ridge revival in the 19th century in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, were happy with what they have, they would have never started the restoration movement. They started the restoration movement because they were unhappy with their present situation. They were unhappy with the Presbyterian Church, with the Baptist Church, with the Methodist Church. They were unhappy by the divisions that these denominations created. Their desire was to go back to the New Testament church because the New Testament church was united, was one church and the one head with one God, with one spirit, with one Bible. That's why they went there. That's why they went to Cain Ridge. That's why they united together to restore the church. They didn't want the traditions that they imported from Europe. They wanted to go back to the drawing board and 
recreate, restore the church as it was in the first century. That is really our, in, in our, our task, our mandate. Our mandate as Churches of Christ is to restore the church back to its original state where truth is evident much more than Christian Protestant evangelical tradition. I'll tell you something. The world is on fire with the concept of restoration. All over the world, restoration is taking over whole denominations, whole churches. And they're not only going to catch up with us, they're going to pass us if they haven't passed us already. I'm talking about pass the churches of Christ in America or the restoration movement in America. Because in China, it's, it's, it's going. I've been going to China since 1996 every year. And the first time that I went to the government church, to the Three Self Church, was last year. The government invited me because the vice president of the state of Wubei uh, in, invited me. And the first question she asked me is, is Jesus American or is he Asian? <laughs> I said, he's Asian. <laughs> she said, how is he Asian? I said, well, Japan, Korea, China are in the east side of Asia. Israel, Jerusalem is in the southwestern corner of Asia, but it's Asia. She said, good. The second question she asked, does Jesus teach democracy? I said, no. Does he teach human rights? I said, no. She said, good. I said, in the time of Jesus, the land of Israel was under Roman occupation. The Romans were not vegetarian. They were very harsh rulers and very abusive of the society, of the, the Jewish society in Israel. She said, do you imply that Chinese government is abusive? I said, no. <laughs> I wanted to get out of China. Uh, but, but essentially she said, we don't want Americans to come here and do mission work in China because they're constantly teaching about democracy and freedom. If you're going to teach only what is in the Bible and about Jesus, we want you to teach in our seminaries. So I taught in the second largest seminary in, in China, in Wuhan, and in another seminary, and I have a... Re they, the, the president of the seminary came to visit me in Israel just a few weeks ago and issued the invitation for me to teach in Nanjing, the largest seminary in, in Wuhan, the second largest. Because they're interested in restoring the biblical church and not some Americana, you know, cotton candy church. Yeah. So the, the, the issues are, are all around the world. All around the world, people are talking about restoration. They never heard of the Church of Christ. They never heard of Campbell. But they realize that something is going awry. Something is wrong. When you have churches that keep on splitting. Before the Civil War, there was one Baptist church in America. Then the Civil War came. They became two Baptist churches. Today, there's more than 40 Baptist denominations in the West. Yeah. There's everything from, from uh, Sabbath-keeping Baptist to missionary Baptist to first Baptist, many, many Baptist denominations. Yeah. And it's going to keep on splitting because it's in the seed. It's in the seed. And the seed for, the, for Christianity is not the Bible. It's not the New Testament. The seed is Western Christian tradition. It's buried in Rome, because if you look at, even at the Restoration Movement, the Churches of Christ, your orientation is European, 
Protestant that is still rooted in Rome. How do I know that? If I was a sociologist or an anthropologist and I would examine by objective means the churches of Christ, I would have to say, you're very much Roman. How do I know that? You're keeping the holidays that originated in Rome. That none of them are in the Bible, not even the 4th of July. <laughs> yeah. You are, especially not St. Valentine's Day. Yeah. You are oriented your tradition, your, your worship style. Not like biblical worship style, but like a Western, Protestant, Roman worship style. The pulpit is a, standing and talking is a, is a Roman practice from the Roman Senate. The Jewish rabbis didn't stand up and talk. Jesus didn't stand up and talk any time. It says that he, he came to the mountain and he sat down to teach. So if I was teaching like a rabbi, there'd be a table here with a chair with a bottle of, of, of water for you guys. <laughs> yeah. And I'd be teaching like a rabbi, like Jesus taught. But, but our culture is very much Greco-Roman and not New Testament Jewish from the land of Israel at the time. Yeah? So when we're talking about restoration, we're talking about very roots, the very essence, the building blocks of our faith. And the building blocks of our faith are a part of Western civilization. And Western civilization is based on the Greco-Roman model. Yeah? I, was a, I see Dr. Hooper over here. I was a student over here at Lipscomb, and I had a teacher by the name of Tim Tucker as a history teacher. And Tim Tucker taught me 45 years ago here on this campus, in this building, that the United States is modern Rome. How do I know that? I know I'm offending you. It's okay. <laughs> Learning comes from suffering. Socrates said that. Socrates already said that a long time ago. Uh, but how do I... How do, Tim, how did Tim teach it at that time? Because you look at the symbols. The Roman eagle is the symbol of what? Of the United States of America. It's in the presidential seal. It's in the congressional seal. The physis inside the Senate. Rome. Yeah. The buildings in Washington. Roman. Right? All these things are, are, are symbolic of the culture. Yeah. Your orientation is very European, in spite of Patrick Henry and Benj Franklin and Jefferson and Washington. Yeah. It's still very European. And your orientation is such. That's why it's difficult for you to look at the New Testament with objective eyes, historical eyes. And to interpret the text as historical texts. These are not texts written yesterday in Dallas, Texas. Yeah. These are ancient texts. If I gave you now 500-year-old English text, like Chaucer, would most of you be able to read it and understand it? No, why not? It's English. We are dealing here with a text that is written in another language, over 2,000 years ago, and the presumption is that we can read it and understand it. You can read it and get saved. Every idiot can get saved. There are people that are saved and alphabets that don't know how to read and write, get saved. They hear the word of God, they believe it, they accept Jesus as their Lord, they're saved. But it doesn't mean that they understand it. You don't have to become a professor of Bible to be saved. But if you're going to teach and work on restoration of, a, of, of the church, and you want to capture the truth, you're going to have to deal with the ancient document that we call the Bible. It's a historical document. And you're going to have to put it in the test tube. Because one characteristic of truth 
is that it can be tested. And testing is objective. Yeah. We had a, a, an old man, survivor of the Holocaust in our congregation, lost his whole family in the Holocaust, ran away from the death camp in the winter of 1944, lived three months in the, in the forest without a coat, without a, a house, without anything, without any cover, almost died but survived by eating leaves and frozen berries from the forest in Germany. Until the Russians came and, and found him. But he would say like this, how can you teach a blind man that there is such a thing as colors? If you have never seen colors, how do you describe to a blind man colors and the difference between blue and red and green and yellow? He's never seen it. He doesn't know what you're talking about. He was born blind. The only way you can do it is by bringing 10 witnesses or more and separating them, and then he would ask them questions. Say to one witness, what is red? And the witness would describe red for him. And then another witness would come and describe the same red and maybe give a, a slightly different description, but it'd still be more or less the same. And that way, after he went through 10 witnesses, that each one described what red means to him and what, red, uh, what emotion red brings into his... Then the blind man could imagine what is red. Yeah? What is blue? What, is, what, what are colors? Yeah? By testing the witnesses. We have this great fortunate generation in which we have more biblical discoveries more biblical evidence than our forefathers a hundred years ago dreamt about. We have such a thing as fulfillment of prophecy. We have such a thing as archaeology. We have such a thing as language that, that is a witness in, it, in its own. Yeah? That we can ascertain that what we believe is true. It's not just mythology. It's not religion. It's truth. And that should be the difference between a restored church and a pagan church. The difference should be whether we have truth that is examinable or we have just traditions and mythological things. How many of you believe, for example, that when the Messiah returns, the lamb will live with the lion in peace? Do you believe that? I'm serious. <laughs> you believe it. Raise your hand if you believe it. All right. You're here with the orange jacket. Why do you believe it? It's what the Bible says. What the Bible says. How many of you agree with her? The Bible doesn't say it anywhere. <laughs> there is no such a text in the Bible. In the Bible, if you want Isaiah 11, Isaiah 65... In both places, parallel texts, the Bible says the wolf will live with the lamb, not the lion and the lamb. But somehow it entered Christian mythology, the lion and the lamb. You go to a Bible bookstore, you see little statues of the lion and the lamb. Yeah. How many times the word Christian appear in the New Testament? One. How many? Three times this brother is right. Three times it appears. Once in Acts 11, 26, once in Acts 26, and once in 1 Peter 4, 16. Yeah? But essentially, we have to get back and understand the New Testament as a historical text in order to know that it is true. Because history has tools, it has instruments to be able to ascertain truth from myth. Okay, so there is a need, in my opinion, there is a need for restoring the church. The, need, the needs are as following. One, the biblical truth that we want to live by and pattern our lives by and teach so that the world can know that Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah. Second, the unity of the church. 
needs to be restored because God did not design thousands of denominations that fight with each other and don't cooperate. I mean, we have a situation even uh, in, the ch in all the churches that exist, not only in the Church of Christ, that one Church of Christ won't cooperate with another Church of Christ, won't do anything together, won't support the same project, won't support the same missionary even. We have churches like that, Forrest. So, uh, unity of the body. The second imperative, the third imperative, why it's important to restoration, because that's the biblical pattern. Bible looks at time in a linear way. It has a beginning and it has an end. History progresses according to that timeline. It goes up, it goes down, but it has a vector that is linear. Which means that the best time that humanity ever had, when was it? In the garden. At the beginning. Humanity has been going down ever since. And I'm not talking about how fast your computer runs. Computers are evolving. They're getting better and better. Our lives are not. I remember my mother was badly burned in a work-related accident. And, and she did laundry by hand. But then she, you know, the washing machine started to come out. Electric washing machines. And she said, oh, man, that would be such a wonderful thing to have electric washing machine, electric mixer, and I'll be able to have so much more time on my hands. I put the clothing in the washing machine, and that's it. You know what? She got the washing machine. She got the mixer. She got all the electrical instruments she could. She didn't have more time. Her life did not become happier because she had a washing machine. Only for a few hours, and after that, it was over. She forgot to buy dishwashing machine uh, powder, and she put uh, uh, dishwashing liquid from the sink in the washing machine. And, and after a while, the bathroom got filled with suds. <laughs> yeah. So the happiness quickly went away from the from the technology. Yeah. Technology doesn't improve people's soul. John Wright. Uh, one of the Nobel Prize winners wrote that the more technological we become, the more lonely we become, the more unhappy we become, the more separated we become. Are there any people here from Dasher? Not those that were in Dasher, but from Dasher. I want to say something bad about Dasher. <laughs> you know, about Valdasta. I haven't been to Valdasta now for 40 some years. When I was in Valdasta, hospitality of the people was fantastic. I can name the people that not one Sunday I was left without lunch after church that somebody didn't invite me to their house. Now when a church invites you, they say, get yourself a motel, rent yourself a car, and we'll pay for it. Yeah. The church hasn't improved. Yeah. It has declined, not improved. Because in those days, 40-some years ago, who would think of, of telling a, a visiting preacher, get yourself a motel, rent yourself a car, take care of yourself, just come at 10 o'clock in the morning to church and preach? Yeah? You wouldn't think of that. It doesn't happen in most of the world that way. Yeah? Because we have lost that concept that going back is progress, not going forward. Our Western uh, mentality is that we are evolving, improving all the time. It's not true. The church, when I came to Georgia in 1962, as a 16-year-old boy, I have some of my old teachers over here, and they remember me and I remember them. And I have the dorm supervisor here, over here that was then the dorm supervisor in Dasher. 
uh, in the crowd. And, and I remember him and his wife with great love, even though he used the paddle on me at least once. Uh, at that time, it was legal. But, uh, but, but the thing is, uh, I arrived there in Dasher, in South Georgia, and the church was small, but very much alive. I saw old women, 70 years old, even eight years old, on Sunday morning come down the aisle, confess that they gossiped against the neighbor. I don't see that anymore in the churches. I don't see even avowed sinners walking down the aisle and confessing anything. Yeah? Every week somebody in Dasher came down the aisle and confessed small things like gossip and other things that they did. It was wonderful. It, it was wonderful. The church was alive. I traveled with the chorus of Georgia Christian School. We went to, to houses all over the South, all the way to, to Nashville and to Kentucky and to Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. And, and the hospitality was fantastic. The church was a family. You had a feeling that you are in a family, that even though you're a stranger, you never saw those people, they welcomed you to their home. They, they opened the table for you. They, they, they received you as a brother. The biblical imperative is found in one of the most difficult books in the Bible that is very little studied by Christians, the book of Lamentations. At the end of the book of Lamentations, chapter 5, verse 21 to the end of the book of Lamentations. Uh, Baruch ben Neriah. By the way, he was the scribe for Jeremiah. And when the, the city of David was being dug in the early 80s, they found a trove, they found a library, essentially. But the books were long burned, but the seals of the book that were made from clay, the fire baked them. So they became like porcelain. From soft clay, they became like porcelain. The Persians burned the library of, of Jerusalem when they conquered Jerusalem. And 52 seals were found. One of the seals that was found was Baruch ben Neriah's seal. And it may be the very seal of the document that Jeremiah gave Baruch to deposit in the royal library of the land that he bought in Anatot, a story that we have in the Bible. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, find. In, that fi in those 52 seals that were found, we have three names of people that we know from the Bible. We're talking about truth. We're talking about proof. That's one of them. Yeah. Small thing, but it has great meaning for us. Yeah. So Baruch ben Neriah ends the book of Lamentation with these verses. I'm reading the New King James, but there are other translations as well. Verse 21, 22. Turn us back to you, O Lord. Another translation says, Restore us to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days as of old, Unless you have utterly rejected us and are very angry with us. Renew our days as of old. Restore us and we will be restored. This concept of going backwards in order to be able to go forward is very, very much the biblical paradigm of restoration. Yeah. When I was a kid, the, the, the state of Israel day of anniversary poster. Every year they make a different poster. They have artists compete to which poster will be used by the government for that year of the day of independence of Israel. One of the posters had a Nehemiah flask inside an old lamp, Herodian lamp from the time of Jesus. And said, the way to our future is 
dictated by our past. Yeah? And this paradigm is very, very important for the restoration of the church. If we want to go forward, we've got to go backwards. If we want to be the New Testament church, we've got to look at the New Testament as our imperative, not choice, imperative, and, and not be swept away by the modern American Christianity. You know, I've had the good fortune or the bad fortune. I'm in Jerusalem, and we have one of the flagship Messianic Jewish congregations in, in, in the world, not only in Jerusalem, but in Jerusalem for, sh for sure. So a lot of the people, that Christians that come to Jerusalem, uh, they visit us, including the most famous telev television evangelists and, and, and preachers and pastors of all the denominations in, 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 in the world. They end up coming to our services because we have a very special service. Our service is uh, on Saturday morning. We, have, we take communion on Sunday afternoon. Uh, and we have a Bible study and a prayer meeting on Sunday afternoon. But our main service is on Saturday morning like every other Jewish synagogue. And, and we, we worship like Jews. You know, we read from the Torah. We use the, the traditional prayer book. And we uh, wear the prayer shawls like I did uh, at noon and last night and tonight again. I was asked to do that. I'm not to blame. <laughs> you know, I would never do it on my own. You know, but I was asked to do that, and I haven't been invited to this campus for many, many years. I decided maybe if I want to get invited again, uh, maybe I better comply with what the authorities to be uh, want me to do. So I, I gave in to it. But essentially, essentially, this idea of going backwards in order to go forward is the whole concept of restoration. But what do you find here, like you find in many other texts? I can give you many texts that talk about restoration in the Bible and, and, and use the same paradigm, including, by the way, in the law of Moses. Um, you could write them down and look at them late, later. Uh, Leviticus chapter 6, verse 4 forward, uh, where we're talking about restoring that which was stolen from you. God says, Restore that which was stolen from you. And, and it, it has the same paradigm. You have to go back and get the original. You can't, if, if you steal a Parker pen, you can't go give him a, a, a big pen instead. You got to go back and find that Parker 51 that you stole and give him the original. Yeah, you can't give him another pen as a restoration, even though both of them write. Yeah? Uh, these concepts are, are key. They're found in Job, in Psalms, King David. Uh, that's, that, that's one of my favorite. Psalms 51, the confession of King David. Confession of King David uh, has this concept well, well uh, stated there. Psalm 51, and we're going to look at uh, verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. I had a joy before I sent with Bathsheba, David says. I lost it. And he's asking God now to restore that joy that he lost. And not take the Holy Spirit away from him. Yeah. But, but th this paradigm is, is key. Now, how do we restore? First of all, by trying to ascertain the best we know what the original was like. What did they do in the first century? How did they worship? What did they believe? What holidays did they keep? Uh, th these things seem simple, but they're not so simple. And not so easy to do. What holidays did they keep? Did they keep the Passover? They did, right? Why don't we keep it? 
Why don't we keep the, the Passover? Tell me. You're not Jewish, but you're a Christian, right? And you want to do what the New Testament commands you to do, right? You're commanded in the New Testament. The Gentiles are commanded in the New Testament to celebrate the Passover. The Gentiles are. Somebody open, the, open your Bible. If I read it, you think that I'm making it up. <laughs> open your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Read from verse 8 and 9. You have there the strongest way of command. The strongest command is you, you have the command, you have the why, and you have the how. When the Bible gives you a command that tells you the command, the why, and the how, it's very strong. It's much stronger than necessary inference. <laughs> we, we're strong on that. We're strong on that, on the necessary inference. We're not so strong on the commands that the New Testament commands us. Okay, who's going to read it for me? 1 Corinthians 5, 8, and 9. Stand up, somebody. Don't be shy, I don't have a stick. No, for Christ is our. All right, read verse seven and eight, nine. All right. So here you have. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast. If somebody knows Greek, he tell me: Is it in command language or not, or it's just a, a suggestion or a, a, a statement? in the air. It's a command. If I say, let us therefore go out of here at 4.30, we'll do it. Let us therefore celebrate the feast. It's a command language in Greek, even in English. And we're told why. Because Christ is our Passover. All right, if Christ is our Passover, we should celebrate the feast. How? Not by the old leaven of malice, but by the new leaven of a good heart, yeah, uh, whatever the text says there. But, but you've been taught by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church worked very hard in the fourth century to uproot the Passover outside of the church. John Chrysostomus, we have three of his sermons from 395, 96, and 97, he was then the Pope in Constantinople. People say he was a saint. He was not a saint. Not for Jews at least. And especially not for those that believe the New Testament. Yeah. He worked hard in three Passovers. He was telling his church in Constantinople, why do you go and celebrate the feast at the same time and together with the Jews? Why was it in the fourth century important for Chrysostomus to tell the church in Constantinople, not to celebrate the feast because they were celebrating it. If they weren't celebrating it, you wouldn't have to tell them not to. Yeah? There are dozens of such examples of things that need to be restored. Our attitude toward Israel needs to be restored. Our attitude toward Israel is inherited from the darkest chapters of Christian history. Because when I became a believer in Jesus, I was taught, not by all my teachers, but by some, that if you're a Jew, you're not a Christian, and if you believe in Jesus, you're not a Jew anymore. Now you were, you were a Jew, now you became a Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> if you're Sephardic, if you're Ashkenazi Jew, you became a German shepherd. <laughs> yeah. But essentially, essentially, you know, restoring the New Testament church is a great challenge. And it is the only thing that we have to sell on the marketplace of modern Western religion. The truth. 
Because if not, who are we competing? Can you com can your preacher compete with Joel uh, Olstein? Yeah. In in selling cotton candy. Yeah. Your preacher can't. He's a master. Yeah. O of it. We we are not going to compete either in the area of worship or in the area of social work or in the area of of taking care of orphans and widows with the Catholic Church. They do it better and for longer than we ever dreamt of being. We don't have a Mother Teresa. Yeah. But the only thing that we have to give to the world that gives us the most important and the greatest edge is the New Testament church, the biblical truth. Yeah. And we're not going to have exclusive rights on it either because there are other smart scholars and intelligent teachers that want the same thing and will bring the same thing whether we do or not. Yeah? But the, the concept of unity, of one church, and the concept of concentration of what we do rather than what, we, uh, have, what creeds we have, that is where our edge is And that is where we need to concentrate our battle. If not, we are endangering the existence of the churches of Christ as a restoration movement, A. And B, we're endangering the very existence of our civilization because Western civilization is in decline. You may not want to hear that, but the world is seeing it. He's seeing your weakness. He's seeing your moral weakness. He's seeing your military weakness. Yes, it's a great, mighty army. But it hasn't won a war since the Korean War. Because of the politicians, not because of the military. Huh? And it's a decline of, of social, moral, religious, economic, every parameter. The West is in decline. And the only people that can change that is people who are believers in God's word and who want to see the, the kingdom of God established here on earth. There's the only people that can change the present situation. But it will require the same kind of tenacity, the same kind of tools, the same kind of courage that people had at Cane Ridge in the beginning of the 19th century. It'll be, require self-sacrifice, getting out of our comfort zones, getting back and trying to look at the New Testament from the roots up. And the roots, by the way, don't get offended, but they're Jewish. Jesus was not a Hottentot. Yeah. He was Jewish. Yeah. And the apostles were Jewish. And, and the gospel is Jewish. I, one of the reasons I believed in Jesus, I was 16 years old, is because a teacher in high school gave me an assignment to write a paper about the beginning, the history of the beginning of Christianity. And when I read the New Testament, I couldn't find anything Christian in it. There is nothing Christian in the New Testament. It's all Jewish. Tell me something Christian. Christmas. Very good. That's the most Christian thing in the New Testament. That's right. Jimmy, tell me something Christian. Which names? Oh, the name Christian. All right. But they didn't call themselves Christian. Others called them Christian in Antioch. Others called them Christians, like Agrippa. In Acts 26, he said, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Yeah? The Hebrew word for Christian is messianic. Same word. One is in Greek. You don't have an English word for Christian. The word Christian is Greek. So you have Christian in Greek, messianic in Hebrew. It's the same word. Translation of one over the other. But there's nothing Christian. You say baptism. Baptism is not Christian. You, you go around the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, you see hundreds of baptisms, baptistries. The Jews baptize. You go to Qumran, 
You see the, the baptistries in Qumran, 200 years before Jesus even. Yeah. Communion, you say. Communion uh, already 200 years before Jesus in Qumran, they were celebrating communion, expecting the Messiah, and called it a messianic feast. And the Orthodox Jews, every Passover, every messianic feast, a messianic meal. There was a big scandal in, the, in Israel this year. The, one of the biggest rabbis in, in Israel, in his messianic meal, the meal of the Messiah, the Lord's Supper, whatever you want to call it, said that the bread was the body of the Messiah and the wine was the blood of the Messiah in an ortho, ultra-Orthodox Jewish context. And the people said, what, what happened to you? Converted to Christianity? They said, no, that's, that's from our tradition as Jews. Yeah. So the Lord's Supper is also not a uniquely Christian thing. Yeah. Everything is Jewish. The New Testament is Jewish. The Bible is Jewish. The New Covenant. Who did God make the New Covenant with? I'm, I'm on purpose disturbing you now and making you uncomfortable. I want you to come back tomorrow <laughs> so I could comfort you. Yeah. But, uh, and bring your friends. There's still some spaces over here. But, but essentially, essentially, the new covenant, who did God make the new covenant with? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. He didn't make it with the Gentiles. All the covenants except one in the Bible is with, are with Israel. Which one is not with Israel? The rainbow. Noah. There were no Israelites there. There were no Jews. There were no... Abraham wasn't born yet. Yeah. That's the only one that God made with the world. All the other... Co how, many, how many covenants that you Christians have? Raise your hand. Well, how many? I didn't hear. Well, how many covenants do you have? That's a covenant. What is it based on? On Christ. So you say you have only one covenant, right? You have that. Anybody agree with him or not? No. You've got many more than one covenant. If you read the New Testament, then you've got many more. For, open Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. And tell me how many covenants you've got there in Christ. You who were a former time called uncircumcised by those who were circumcised. Yeah? That's how it starts. You Gentiles, it starts. Who were called uncircumcised. Right? You've got it? Who has it? Go ahead, read it, somebody. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. One more verse. But now in Jesus Christ, who formerly were you who were formerly far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So how many covenants you didn't have? It says covenants in the plural, right? Huh? All of God's covenants are important. All of them are important. The, the, the rainbow in the heavens is important. No less. All of God's word is important from Genesis to Revelation. Because when Paul was going in the synagogues in Berea, in Thessalonica, in Corinth, in Ephesus, and teaching there on the Sabbath day, he was preaching from which book? You think he was preaching from the book of uh, 1 John? or the book of Revelation, or the book of Acts, they weren't written then. The only thing that he had to preach from was from the law and from the prophets. 
And if we separate our faith from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and the rest of the books of the Bible, we are, have no ground to stand on whatsoever. And everything becomes subjective and mythological. Because the reason Jesus is the Messiah is because of what God promised to Abraham. The reason why Jesus is the Messiah is because of what God promised to David. The reason why Jesus is the Messiah is because of what God promised to Isaiah and Amos and Hosea and Ezekiel and all the prophets. Without that, you've got no leg to stand on. Your feelings are no better than a Buddhist. Because if you talk to a Muslim, yeah, what, uh, how, how, what do you get out of your faith in, in, in Muhammad? Yeah? He'll tell you, I was born again. My life meant nothing. I was in the darkness. And now that I've discovered Muhammad the prophet, then I have light. I'm happy. I have a relationship with God. The same terminology. If you talk to an Orthodox Jew, He'll give you the same terminology. We have no exclusivity on subjectivity and on feelings. And not on joy or happiness. We've got no mo monopoly on it. Yeah? The only monopoly we have, and if you leave here today with this idea, is the biblical truth. That's the only monopoly we have. We have zero other monopoly, zero other market, uh, other than the biblical truth. Without that, our faith and all of Christianity and all of the Western civilization doesn't mean a hill of beans. Yeah? That's why restoring the first century church is an imperative. It is essential. And it's hard work. Yeah? It's hard work because when you deal with facts, when you deal with, with something that is beyond reasonable doubt, it's painful. It's painful because essentially, I'll, I'll give you my own take on this. When I read the Bible, when I read the New Testament, I, especially the Gospels, I feel a great burden on my back. Not a monkey's on my back. A, a, a silverback gorilla is on my back. Yeah? Because I feel that I must follow in the footsteps of the Son of God, of Jesus. As a fellow Jew, as a fellow human being that made it, went up to heaven, improved humanity. I will end today with this, with, with this short story. We've been in court now for 10 years in order to get a building license for our building in Jerusalem. And we've won every round, and the ultra-Orthodox appealed every round, and finally we reached the Supreme Court. We had the court case in the Supreme Court. The, the lawyers on the case cost $60,000. The opposition, which was the neighborhood synagogue, and the rabbi of the neighborhood also had to pay $60,000. But he didn't follow the Jewish protocol, the Jewish law. And according to Jewish law, you cannot take a person to court without first talking to him face to face and trying to reconcile face to face. Only if you can't reconcile face to face, you go to court. This is, reminds you of Matthew 18. It's Matthew 18. But this ultra-Orthodox rabbi called my office. And he said, uh, I want to talk to Mr. Joseph Shulam. My secretary said, come to the office. We'll make you an appointment. No, I don't want to come to the office. I want to go to the church. So fine. We waited for him. Our youth minister, my wife, and I waited for the rabbi to come to church. He was scared to death. Before he entered our building, he looked to the right, he looked to the left, that nobody sees him entering our building. 
He entered in and he looked around. He said, oh, where's the cross? I said, we don't have a cross. He said, well, aren't you Christian? I said, we believe that Jesus is our Messiah. He said, well, I see that you have a Torah cabinet. Do you have any scrolls in it? I said, let me open it for you. I open it. He sees four scrolls. He says, well, you have four Torah scrolls. I said, no, we have three. And one is a scroll of the prophets. He said, oh, wow. He said, where'd you get that? We don't even have one of those in our synagogue. <laughs> uh, so he told me his story, which was fascinating. Because he was raised in Brooklyn in the same synagogue with Milkin. Who knows who Milkin is? The junk bond king. Remember the, the junk bond king that sat in jail for four years after he, he, he robbed people of $4 billion, paid $600 million fine, sat for four years and came out. He had some money left over. <laughs> yeah. And Boisky, another one of those Wall Street bandits. And Madoff. All raised by the same synagogue, by the same rabbi. I wonder what he was teaching them. <laughs> you know. but, but anyway, this rabbi was one of that, that group of children that were raised together, went to uh, elementary school together, high school together, and Yeshiva University in New York together with all these guys. So he told me his story, how he became a rabbi, he came to Israel. Then I told him, he asked me to tell him why I believe in Jesus. When I told him that Jesus is the most important Jew that ever lived. Jesus is the Jew that spread the knowledge of the God of Israel around the globe. If you go to the jungles of Brazil. And the Amazon, up, upper Amazon River by the Peru. And you ask the Indians, do you know Rabbi Akiva? Or maybe Rabbi Hillel or Shammai. They say, who? We never heard of him. You say, Jesus Oh, as a Salvador mio, is my savior. Yeah. Through Jesus, people know who Moses is. Through Jesus, they know who King David is. Through Jesus, they know about Abraham. Yeah. Jesus is the, the Jew that brought the world to Jerusalem. I mean, since last night, I counted at least five songs about Jerusalem and Zion. Oh, Zion, Zion. What, what are you singing about? This is Athens of the South. It's not Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah. You're singing about Jerusalem when you sing about Zion. About the land of Israel. You are connected. The rabbi started to cry when I told him about Jesus. Yeah, nobody else has ever witnessed to him in this wake. Because everybody's witnessing to him about Christianity. For me, Christianity is not a wonderful thing. It's a horrible thing. And it should be horrible for you. Do you know Christian history? Do you know the wars that Christians fought against each other? Even in the 20th century in Ireland for 40 years. Christians against Christians. They set bombs in, in, in pubs and in restaurants and blew each other up. Yeah. There were decades and decades of war in Europe. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people died because of baptism. The Anabaptist wars. Am I right, Dr. Hooper? Yeah. Besides what they did to the Jews. Yeah. For I am not a, a, a proud of Christianity. I am proud of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm proud of the, of, of the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. I am proud of being a disciple of the Messiah that died for me. I am proud of the fact that he raised from the dead, that he ascended to heaven, that he is waiting to come back. I'm proud of these things. Yeah. But I'm not proud of being a Protestant. Because I, the only Protestants in the New Testament were the Pharisees. They were protesting against Jesus. Are you a Protestant? <laughs> you know? What are you a Protestant for? Yeah. I remember being in the Abilene Christian University lectureship when uh, Hughes, Hughes and Alan wrote, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, 
church, the history of the Church of Christ or something like that, they wrote, who was the, 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 these two professors that wrote the book? They started the history of the Church of Christ from Scotland. Yeah. The only, other, the only good thing from Scotland is Mr. Johnny Walker. I mean, <laughs> you know. And the other single malts. Yeah. I, got, I, I lost nothing in Scotland. I owe nothing to Scotland. I owe to Jesus. Amen. I owe to Paul, to Peter, to the apostles, to John. I don't owe anything to Scotland or to the United States or to anything for my faith. And this has to be the paradigm of the restoration of the New Testament church. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about the, the relationship of the church with Israel because that's another one of these things. I've got another four minutes. Don't go. <laughs> I came all the way from Israel to talk to you. Especially. Yeah. Uh, the relationship of the church with Israel didn't come from the New Testament. It came from the Catholic Church, from the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition, where the Catholic Church invented this lie that if you're a Jew, you can't be a Christian, and if you're a Christian, you can't be a Jew. They changed their names. They changed their names from, from Abu Av to Santos, De Maria, Oliveira, Palmera, Videra, Castro, Cardozo, all these names are names that the Catholic Church gave when they forced the Jews to convert in Spain and Portugal. Yeah. That's where this idea came that you can't be a Jew and a Christian at the same time. The idea that the church is separated from Israel, that God rejected Israel, and now we are the new Israel, is not a biblical idea. It's nowhere in the Bible. On the contrary, Paul says it very clearly in, in Romans 11, verse 1, 2. He says, as God rejected his people whom he foreknew, Paul's answer is different than most of the preachers and elders of the church of Christ. If we want to be like the first century church, we've got to give the same answer that Paul gave. No, in no way, I am a Jew. He doesn't say, I was a Jew, and now I became a Cocker Spaniel. Yeah. He says, I am a Jew, in the present tense, at least five times in his letters and in the book of Acts. Yeah. We have got to restudy the Bible. When I came to the States in 62, the joke was that in the courthouse, if they didn't have a Bible for people to swear on, they would say, anybody here from the Church of Christ, put your hand on his head. The Bible is inside. <laughs> it's no longer so, brethren. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.